We love you, Father. We praise you, Father. We glorify you, Father. In Jesus' name. I am tired. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, we've come together in your name, Jesus. We've come together in your name. We've come to seek your face. We've come to hear from you. We've come to give ourselves to you, Father. We've come to give ourselves to you, Father. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. He come omoho shatabahay. My. Maya Mahasi, Amamahai, Mamahasi, Mamaha. Here, my Mamahasi, Mamaniataha. He, Kie, Kie, my Mamahasatahai. Yalamo Ramahai, a Loro Bokuratahai. Halaro Bokurana, Namatahai. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I praise you, Father. I lift you up, Father. I glorify you, Father. You are worthy. You're worthy of all of our praises. All of our honor, we, we give you praise and honor and glory. The kingdom's yours. It's your name that's worthy to be glorified. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I take dominion and authority 
over every spirit that would war against this service in any fashion. I bind you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and command that you leave this place. Loose us in Jesus' name. Flee in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I loose the angels of God to minister for those that shall be heirs of righteousness. I loose the gifts of the Spirit to be manifested for the edification of the church. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I loose the name of Jesus to be manifested and it might be glorified and sanctified in our hearts and minds and spirits. I loose the kingdom of God that it might come in manifestation, that the Lord might be glorified. I loose the will of God as it's purposed in heaven to be done in earth this night in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I loose the word of God to have free course, that the word of God would be ministered by the Spirit of the Lord. In the name of Jesus. 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 Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. 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 Sikia mana maha satata mamaha. Siki e kata la 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 in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Makababa ka sakata baba bahata tabaha ie kataha. Shakababa hataha ababa hasataha. Ratia mama makataha. Yala ram mama mama katia tahama mahasutie. Robuhukai, Haloruta, Yamusi, Kati, Amamaha, Robuhushi, Ki, Mama Hosi, Boye, Amandola, Rotaha, Sata, Tata, Bahaya. Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus' name, we submit ourselves to you, Father for us to be drawn to you, that you might pour upon us the spirit of prayer and supplication in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you might pour upon us the spirit of grace and peace in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Ha, ikaba ha, aba ha, sike ha, ha. Urubuhu sai amama hata baba ha Robuku sahaya ta ha Ramaye ki e kusiki e kala raha baba hata ha Hallelujah 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 Shika baba sata ta na mama ha Mala robuku shaya in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Shikieta haya hamahaya hamahaya Shikieta ela mahaya 
shikieti eka mahaya la moti e shalala mahaya la masa hati e hallelujah hallelujah my god ha. woo ma 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 ha simando ye babo kusiki eka maha in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus ah. hallelujah 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 Jesus name Jesus name ki ala murieta bahaya ki ala mula murieta bahaya lo bohosia si ana e ana ana hasaya halarada mokorata bahaya hallelujah 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 Woo, my, 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 ha. Woo, ha, my, yay, kabahai, abahai, abahasa. Rubu yay, kie, kalarabahai, abahasi. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God, praise God, praise God. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. You can be seated, God bless you. Uh, one, one little note here, and this is so out of where what we've just been doing. But I, I, I really like to do this. I, I don't know what happens with other people, but because I have given myself all of my ministry to trying to learn to hear and repeat, uh, it's not totally unusual that the Lord will give me a thought and then it begins to flow and I I have to go back and listen to what was preached to know what was said because the whole focus is not on some outline or whatever. The whole focus is trying to hear what the next thing is. And uh, I did that for a little while this afternoon, for this afternoon, this late afternoon, for this af the, the 1230 session because that was all brand new for me. And uh, I noticed that it looked like I was scowling. I'd like to clarify that if you don't mind. Uh, my ophthalmologist told me uh, some years back when I was having cataract surgery that, I, that because I had such light colored eyes, they were very sensitive to light. And if you don't know anything about photography or videography, uh, an inexpensive camera with good lighting takes better pictures than expensive cameras with poor lighting. And if you've ever watched our stream, especially on uh, uh, something like an iPad, it looks like it's HD. Trust me, we don't have that kind of money yet. One of these days, the Lord will bless us with money for HD. But right now, it looks like HD. So one of the reasons for that is because we have such good lighting. So it looks like I'm scowling, but I'm squinting. And I, I kept looking at that and saying, right, what is your problem? And then it hit me. I wasn't scowling at anybody. I, I couldn't see. I have to squint to cut down the amount of light coming in. So just in case you're wondering, I, I, I love Jesus and I'm happy. I'm not, I'm not scowling. I'm not scowling. I, I'm squinting. I can't see. And with that right there and all that light flooding me, I have a hard time seeing, and I'm an eye contact person. I like to look people in the eyes because what I don't hear you telling me in the spirit, you tell me the rest of it with your eyes. That's one reason I don't like to use notes because your focus becomes here, not there. 
or at least not use notes that are anymore just in a point of reference, not a script that you learn how to perform. Hallelujah. Now, I probably wouldn't say that in your pulpit, but this is uh, partly still my pulpit. So I'm going to say that here, okay? I, I don't want to be offensive to anybody, but I'm not in your pulpit, so hallelujah. Praise God. It seems like we, people can't even get up at general conference anymore and give an announcement. It's all scripted. Have to stand up there and read every word. They say, what, what is up with that? People don't know how to talk anymore? I mean, really, what? I, seriously. People don't know how to talk anymore. They don't trust themselves or God. They have to, they have to read every word that they're saying. Oh, well, wow. I, I'm sure glad I'm not that paranoid. Some probably think I need to read. Nope. Nope. I have been taking the consequences of this ministry for 46 years, and I will take the consequences of it the rest of my life because I have one goal and that's to allow Jesus to speak unfettered unfettered by convention unfettered by opinion that is I'm not talking about being mean I, I've never purposely been mean to anybody in, from the pulpit in my life but uh, I call it straightforward some call it blunt others call it worse than that it all depends on how it's hitting you and whether or not you appreciate it or don't appreciate it that that's how where you come up with the words that you qualify it with praise god and i'm very thankful to know that i'm not the only one like that i have there are men that i respect very very highly who do the same thing uh they let the lord tell them what to say it, can it get you in trouble well, he got uh, Jeremiah throwing a hole. Got the apostles killed. Got Stephen killed. Poor guy, he preached one message that we know of, and he's dead. Really? I wonder how what Jesus was thinking, being God manifest in the flesh, when he spent all that time training James, knowing James wasn't going to last very long. He gave the same training to James as he did Peter and John and whatever. And wow, this is off the subject. I just, you know, really, that's, that's an amazing thing. That while his flesh didn't know everything, uh, his spirit knew all things. And he had to have some idea that James was going to be the first martyr uh, that we know of specifically recorded in the scripture. Well, I'm out there, so I'll try to get back now. Praise God. Okay, now, I'm hesitant to make a pronouncement. I really am. Because just about the time I make the pronouncement, because of what I'm feeling at this moment, the Lord will switch it up on me just to see what I do about it. Um. Some of you used to come to our manifest meetings. And we went five nights and four days more intense than this. We were in prayer or teaching probably 14, sometimes 16, 18 hours in a day for four and a half days. Honestly, that's no exaggeration. Ask folks are here that were there. Okay. And what we learned was because we were doing four of these a year for several years, uh, what we learned was that, was that the Lord had a pattern. And without any planning on our part, he, did, he stuck by the pattern. And the first part of the meeting was always an emptying out. And then the second part of the meeting was always an impartation of putting in. And the, the length of time for the first before the second could start was always up to the people. It just depended on how quickly you wanted to empty out. So based on what I'm feeling to do tonight, it would seem as though the Lord had said, okay, that's as empty as I'm going to get some folks, so let's start. 
Um, so I want to I, I talk about moving your mountains tonight. Um, in the scripture, mountains are used frequently to represent obstacles, especially spiritual ones. To remove them, we must speak to them, command them to be removed. Mountains do not go away if ignored or given enough time or you can't go around these mountains. Whatever the mountain is in your way, you will either be blocked by it for as long as you choose to be blocked by it, or you'll remove it. There is no other option. There is no other option. The scripture clearly communicates to us that Jesus expected us to be able to deal with our mountains. And he didn't say anything about preachers. He was talking about all of us, that we should be able to deal with our mountains. You say, well, boy, that's a pretty awesome thing. Yeah, he said that it, only the select few that had mustard seed side faith could deal with mountains. That's sarcasm. Sarcasm alert. Okay. In other words, if you don't have at least mustard seed side faith, you're not saved at all. So therefore, everybody that's saved should have enough faith to deal with their mountains. So therefore, if I'm here, a part of the thing, the things of God, and I don't have mustard seed, I don't have enough faith in my mind to deal with my mountains and then be moved, then I need to identify what it is in me that's preventing that from happening. And a lot of times, uh, your mountain won't be a what. It'll be a who. Most of the time, it'll be a supernatural who. Some of the time, it will be a natural who. Someone or something that is an obstacle in your walk with God. Uh, Jeremiah 51 and 25 uh, says, the Lord says, Behold, I am against thee, O destroying mountain, saith the Lord, which destroyest all of the earth, or all the earth. And I will stretch out mine hand upon thee, and roll thee down from the rocks, and will make thee a burnt mountain. Now, I don't think there's anybody here that would believe that this could possibly be referring to a human being. It's a who. This mountain is a who, but it's not a human being. And then, of course, one of my very favorite passages in all of the Scripture, I know we're not supposed to have favorites, but there's some that just kind of, click with us and whatever is Zechariah chapter 4 uh, beginning with verse 1 it is the chapter it's the, the it's the whole chapter uh, while it may have some kind of implications for the for Israel for the Jews it is the most descriptive chapter in the Old Testament for end time worldwide apostolic revival and harvest it's not even just a prophecy of the church age it's a prophecy of the end time of the church. And the angel that talked with me came, uh, came again and wake, waked me as a man that is waking out of his sleep and said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick all of gold with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes of the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof. And the two and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side thereof. Now, that right there tells you this is figurative, it's not literal. It's not a literal candlestick or lamp stand because there's no such thing as a candle in Scripture. So it was called candlesticks by the 1611 translators. But in Bible times, it was nothing similar to what we call a candle there. They were lamp. 
they were, it was a lampstand. It was a hollow uh, thing. It was made out of metal, and it was, and you filled it up with oil and put wicks in the tops of each one of them, and you, uh, you could light that. And that was the only source of natural light in the holy place, both in the tabernacle and in the temple. But we know that this is not a literal candlestick or lampstand because of the two olive trees standing by it. And of course, the usual oil, especially in the tabernacle and temple, was olive oil. And these two trees demonstrated an unlimited supply at the two outer pipes of the lampstand. The lamp was uh, a center pipe with three short or three identical concentric half circles. And so the, the middle one, the fourth one, was the shortest. Uh, and then you had the next two, and each one of those two sides is uh, two and five. And then uh, you had another one, and they, all, they were even across the top. And then the next one would be then two and six. And then the longest of the half circle that uh, was concentric, meaning they had, this, had the exact same radi uh, radii, uh, but uh, they were, they were, the radiuses were longer, but they were concentric, whatever that is. It's been too long. So anyway, then you had first and seven. So the, 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 the first candlestick and the last candlestick were the two, the two candlesticks uh, or the two lamp uh, openings that were the source of supply for the entire lampstand for oil. And it was poured in the first one and poured in the last one. And in this vision, the first one had its own source of supply, an olive tree that per perpetually provided oil. Uh, olives so that there could be a perpetual sly, a supply of olive oil through the first one. And it, the second one had its, also had its own olive tree. with its, uh, So it was, a, it was the source of supply for the seventh uh, lamp. And uh, this in typology would be outpouring of the Spirit because we know from Revelation chapter 1 that the seven golden candlesticks or the lampstand made out of gold is the church of the living God and we find Christ standing in the midst of the seven golden candlestick and the, the mystery, the revelation of the mystery of the lampstand is it was the church. So here this is a revelation of the church, the coming church in the, the Old Testament. And in this context, in this context, uh, it is a finished work. It's not a work in progress. It's finished. It's made all of gold. It's finished. It's complete. And it has these two sources of oil, the first, the first lamp and the last lamp. Notice there was no differentiation made between the size of the tree or whatever. So therefore, if the early church received an outpouring, the last day church is going to receive an outpouring. Okay, so I, I went into all of that just so you would see the significance of this passage. And so uh, verse uh, 4 says, so I answered. This is uh, Zechariah is saying to the angel. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? This candlestick and these trees. What are these, my Lord? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? You, you don't know what this is? And I answered, or I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered, and I want you to notice very carefully, he did not tell him what it was. What he told him was how to get it. Was it time for the revelation of what it was? What are these, my Lord? That answer wasn't given to him. But he was given 
the clue or the key as to how to get whatever that was. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Not by human strength and ability, not by the numbers of people with you, the word there, uh, power, if I remember correctly, is army, an army of men. It's not, by, it's not by how many people are with you. It's not by human strength and ability. It's not by the number of people who are with you, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts, or the Lord of armies. The hosts are the angelic armies of heaven. And notice this next verse. Who art thou, O great, who art thou, O great mountain? <coughs> Before Zerubbabel, that's the man who was charged with rebuilding the temple. Before Zerubbabel, thou shalt become a plain. Right now you're a mountain, and a great mountain, a great obstacle, a great amount of resistance. But before this God-called man of God charged with a purpose and a vision and a commission from God, you may be a mountain, but before him, you're going to become a plain. Now, since this is a, is a vision of the church with both of its outpourings included, and since in this case Zerubbabel, would represent, in my opinion, opinion, okay, uh, the New Testament church in ministry. Not the ministers of the New Testament church, but the New Testament church in ministry. Because, of course, and I don't mean this offensively to anybody that's sitting here or anybody that's watching, uh, you know, we are apostolic, we're not Catholics. Catholics would tell you they're Catholic, they're not apostolics. All I'm doing is saying the same thing that they would say, but the opposite. Okay? Free country, you can be a Catholic, you can be an apostolic, you can be nothing. It's all your choice. Uh, but, the, but the bottom line is this. <laughs> um, the, one of the main differences between apostolic and Catholic is we believe everybody is called to the priesthood. Everybody. We believe in the priesthood of all believers. Or at least theoretically we do. And I don't want to get off on that. I'm, I'm, I'm pulling. I'm holding on to that one really going. Because whoo, it wants to go out there for a while. But the promise here is, before this man who represents ministry, in my opinion, not just ministers, but ministry, before this man of God, this great mountain of obstacle, of, uh, uh, of, of supernatural resistance is going to become just like a plane. And I, I think it's really important to understand the word who there is almost never used in Scripture in regards to anything, any, anything or anybody but humans, people in this context. So you say, well, I thought it was spirit. Yes, a spirit being, not a thing. <laughs> Our problem is we have a tendency to see what's in front of us instead of what's behind what's in front of us. I said we have a tendency to see what's in front of us instead of what's behind what's in front of us. Because if you deal with what's in front of you based on what you see or what you're naturally aware of, the problem is you're not going to get the outcome that you're expecting because what's behind it is the problem. Oh, Jesus. 
The Bible says we're not ignorant of his devices. That's one pl place the Bible is not true because we prove it wrong every day. I mean, the scripture gives us a whole lot more credit than we deserve because we are ignorant of his devices. And we prove every day we're ignorant of his devices. When the devil jumps out at you and goes, boo! And I'm being facetious, but when he does that, he is doing it for the purpose of intimidation because he is in a position of great weakness. He never reveals himself unless he is weakened. His greatest weapon is his subtlety. That's his greatest weapon. And the Bible talks the gift about the gift of discerning of spirits. It's, there, there is no gift of discernment. It's a gift of discerning of spirits. Basically, that's, that's saying the Lord enables you to see what's behind something. So you can deal with the problem and not the symptom. The devil loves for us to pay, play patty cake with him. I rebuke in Jesus' name, rebuke in Jesus' name, rebuke in Jesus' name. Re okay, you know, it's spiritual patty cake because we don't mean it. We don't have any faith behind it. And he's only occupying us and then undermining our faith more because nothing's happening when we, when we do that. Because we don't understand what's going on and we're not dealing with what's going on. Okay. <laughs> Last year, uh, one of the main primary focuses of Call of War last year was dealing with the most three most obvious symptoms that a church needs to do spiritual warfare. There are three of them. Where'd you get these? God gave them to me. And I've never seen them fail. But I have seen them misinterpreted continuously. The first one is when there is no spontaneous flow in liberty of worship and praise that does not have to be started. It has to be stopped to do something else. I don't know if you've ever been a part of something like that, but I have. And I will trust. I, I will pr promise you this, and you can trust me on this all the way to the bank. Once you've ever experienced that, nothing else comes close to being good enough. It just doesn't. It just doesn't. And you will have what you settle for. And whatever you determine to call good, that's going to be good to you. And whatever you call good enough is what's going to be good enough for you. And it really doesn't matter what God's willing to do. If you're going to call this good enough when God was willing to do this. And the reason we call this good enough is because of what would we would have to do to get from this to this. We'd have to move some mountains. I've been in situations where people had to have a little bell they rung in a microphone to get people to settle down. And, and why would you do that? Because everything should be done decently in order. When the person in charge feels in the Holy Ghost, it's time to do something else, then it's time to sit down. 
<laughs> oh, God, help me. Jesus. <laughs> um, and I've been in places where that kind of stuff happens so infrequently. They're afraid to stop it. They want to squeeze every little bit. Of it. They, they can get out of it because they're not sure when it'll ever be back again. Because they have no idea what brought it. They have no idea what makes it go away. Second of all, biblically, there should be a free flow of sinners, a free flow of sinners into your ministry. And your efforts to evangelize should be blessed with success. I'm not talking about building a crowd. I'm talking about reaching the lost. And if you can't hardly get visitors to come, and all of your efforts are essentially fruitless, you can make whatever excuses you want. But the bottom line problem is, you got some stuff you need to battle. Unless, of course, you want to begin the excuses and, well, we're in a hard area and people don't really want what we want, or what, want what we've got. And, you know, you can't really expect these people to want to live like we live today. Blah, 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 blah. And then third, people should be able to get the Holy Ghost very easily in your services. No long tarrying as a rule. No, 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 no Pentecostal gymnastics trying to get them through. Hold on, turn loose. Hold on, turn loose. Hold on, turn loose. Screaming, holler in their ears, all that kind of stuff. The Holy Ghost is a gift. They shouldn't have to try to Earn it, capture it, wrest it away from God. And there should be occasional periods where people spontaneously receive the Holy Ghost without somebody praying for them. That's biblical. But of course, you, you, you have to decide what's good enough. What are you willing to live with? What are you willing to live without? Someone asked me, well, why do we need these signs? Because none of us are always so on target and sharp and in our discernment. And the scripture frequently gives us indicators. The scriptures, how about this one? The scripture says, ye shall know them by their fruits. That's exactly what I'm talking about here. The fruit of a worship service should be free with a move and a flow of the Spirit of God. That's, that's the fruit of, a, of a, an anointed, powerful worship service. I have a right to look at the fruit of a worship service and say, hey, that's good. Ah, something's wrong. I have a right to look at, 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 at the crowd. <laughs> couple of about three Sunday nights ago I was up in our we have two Sunday night services one here and one in Baltimore and I was up in our with our Baltimore group and man alive boy they, they it was awesome they were dancing all over the place it was just amazing and uh, I got up and I went oh god okay and I said to the two pastors we have two daughter works that meet in one congregational service on Sunday night and I said to the two pastors there's a problem with this congregation I mean, they've been tearing up Jack, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it has just been amazing. You can feel God. Your, your goosebumps can feel God. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's powerful. And I looked at those guys, and I said, there's a problem with this congregation. They kind of looked at me. They didn't know what was coming out of my mouth. Said, I said, I recognize almost all of these faces from Thursday night. 
almost all of these faces are people that drive from Baltimore all the way to Arnold on Sunday night for leadership training, for discipleship training. And you could just see it in faces, and that's a problem? Yeah, because it's not enough balanced. There's not enough sinners here. There's not enough babies here. And when you've got a group of people that is that high a percentage of committed people, it's only a matter of time till it turns in on itself. And what's good becomes bad because it'll consume itself. And an apostolic church service with no sinners in it? Something is wrong. Something's wrong. And sincere, dedicated people that love God and pray, that go out, that witness personally and go out and organize efforts to try to reach the lost, and nothing's happening. Something is wrong. Not wrong with them. Wrong in the spirit world. Something needs to be dealt with. And the Holy Ghost is a gift. Again, you don't earn it and you don't wrestle it away from God. It's freely given. So easy, little children can receive it. And when you pray with people and they just can't get through, and, and you pray and pray and they can't get through, there's something wrong. Whether it's in a home group, in a, in a preaching point, in a daughter work, in your main church or whatever, on, in the office, on the street, in the school. It doesn't matter where it is. If, if, if the ministry you're a part of, uh, you're not able to pray people through the Holy Ghost easily, there is a biblical problem. You have a mountain. For better or for worse, I have been highly privileged to preach on every continent except Australia. I'm here to tell you something right now. All this stuff about cultural differences and rich and poor and educated and uneducated. That's a bunch of stuff. Because humanity is the same everywhere you go. I said humanity is the same everywhere you go. And you have the hungry and those that are willing to settle. The ones that say anything, Lord. And the one says, ah, it's a little too high. It's that, that price tag's a little too steep for me. Well, what you got less than that that's on sale? You, you running any specials on anything, Jesus? I, I, I've only got a, a certain amount I'm willing to spend. And uh, I want to see what I can get for that. The Lord promised that our mountain would become a plain. That doesn't happen by osmosis. It doesn't just happen at all. It has to be changed. Isaiah 40 verse 3 it gives us a prophecy, part of the intent of the Lord. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, lifted up. Every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. This isn't talking about one, this isn't geology or geography. It's not talking about topography. This is all spiritual stuff. 
This is the ministry of Jesus. To lift up that which is down. Bring down that which is high and obstructing. That's warring against us. That's what Jesus does. That's what he wants to do. You've got Jesus in you. I've got Jesus in me. <laughs> Praise God. So let's talk about what Jesus told us to do. He talked to us to, told us to speak to our mountain. I'm going to admit to you the following Principles are really simple to talk about, but they're difficult to exercise because of the price necessary to have them work for you. I'm beginning reading with Mark eleven twelve. And I want you to notice that Jesus makes it very clear that every Holy Ghost filled believer that's implied here because this is still in the Gospels has the authority to come against their mountains. Mark eleven twelve, or excuse me, yeah, eleven twelve. And on the morrow when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. Jesus, the man Christ Jesus was hungry and seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves he came if haply or by chance or possibly he might find anything thereon and when he came to it he found nothing but leaves now notice this next statement for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto the fig tree, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. Now, I'm going to tell you what. I, I got to be really honest with you. I have puzzled over this so many times. Our God is a God of love and kindness he created the cycles, the seasons. He knew what the season was for those fig tree. He knew that it wasn't the season for figs. He knew that. And he would curse this tree because it didn't have figs on it. When it wasn't the season for figs. Uh, here's the problem. <laughs> he didn't do that because of the tree. He did that because of us. He wanted us to know that there would be times he would come to us expecting things for us when it just didn't fit easily in our world right now. It just wasn't our season for figs. It's just not, it just doesn't fit in our time of life at this moment. We have other things to worry about. Some of you know, some of you don't know, but uh, five days after we ended call to war last year, I was at a doctor's office with my wife, and she was diagnosed with breast cancer. I had spent July, August, September, October, and that first almost full two weeks of November with the greatest flow of word in my life and the greatest time of communication between him and I I've ever had in my life, ever in my life. And when I got up on November the 14th for us to prepare to go to the doctor, I immediately recognized the flow was not there. Wasn't there. Well, the good thing was, I, you know, and, and I'm not, I, please 
receive this from a standpoint of trying to understand stuff and, oh, God, what have I done wrong, which I would have done uh, sometime before that. That would have been my response. Oh, oh, oh God, I've sinned. No. I knew there wasn't anything I had done that would cause him to punish me with the flow stopping. And uh, I knew because my ministry is flow based, because my ministry absolutely is totally dependent upon hearing and repeating, and I have never learned to perform without it ever without it. I haven't, I haven't done that. I'm not interested in learning how to perform without the flow. Because of that, I knew immediately what the signal from the Lord was. That from that moment until he said otherwise, my ministry was Alice Wright. That was my ministry. And uh, without going through all the story, we went through some very, very difficult times and uh, went through uh, four months of chemo, went through all the grief of this apostolic that had never had a pair of scissors in her hair for 62 years, losing all of it. And uh, you can take this however you want to. She was more distressed over losing her hair than she was the cancer because we had an assurance it was a journey. It was going to be a journey. He wasn't going to instantly take it away. But we knew she was going to be. We knew we knew she was going to be all right. We believed she was going to be all right. We had peace over that. But now the hair deal. Oh my God! It was such grief. Great grief. She had surgery on May the twenty seventh, and uh, came through that with flying colors. And the doctor was very happy. And I woke up. On Monday morning, June the 9th, and the flow was back. And it came back just like it left. It was turned off fully in a heartbeat, and it was turned on without me doing anything to turn it on. And I can tell you right now that that almost seven months, I love my wife, and we were, we were together in absolutely everything. She didn't have cancer. We had cancer. She didn't have surgery. We had surgery. I was very thankful that the Lord had allowed me to be in such a position that I was available to be with her, and it was wonderful. But I'm going to tell you something. What he also let me experience was what a person goes through when they put their circumstances ahead of him in ministry. And I was in that situation by his direction. And it didn't change anything. Oh, you know. Having cancer is like raising children. The days drag by and the months fly by. And it's, whew. And you're so focused on that. And every little report and, and, and pray and everything just, just to try to get, make it another day and just, just to hang on to your faith. And, not, and, 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 and we, we felt we were supposed to submit to what the doctor said to a point, but at the same time to discern, okay, they say do this, let's go this far, but we're not going that far we're going we'll go this far no we're not going that far because we don't have we don't have liberty to go that far and to spend all that time focused on that and it's just trying to and not not be a part of his purpose not be a part of his plan his kingdom boy the toll is really high it's really high and so he comes to this fig tree. He's hungry. He's the creator God. The word that was spoken to bring everything created, robed in or manifested in flesh, and then the creator God that spoke that word dwelt in that manifestation. 
He knew it wasn't time for figs. But he was hungry. And he looked for figs. And there wasn't any. Even though he knew his created principle meant there weren't any figs. God, if you'll allow me to put it this way, I know it was the man. God was hungry for something. And it wasn't a convenient time for that tree. And I wonder what we do when the Spirit of the Lord comes to us and it's not a convenient time for us. I wonder if that's a test, a trial. <laughs> what, what did he say? No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. His disciples heard that. No man eat fruit of you hereafter forever. Verse 20, and in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree. This is some days later. They saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. When he spoke that simple word, no more, no, no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. The disciples heard the word. Nothing happened that they saw. Oh, you've got to get this. You've got to get this or this is never going to work in your life. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And if you've got to have an instant reaction to confirm your puny little faith, are you going to give up on God? You just, it's just not going to work for you because it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. God doesn't work like that. Peter Caller remembers, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursedest is withered away. And Jesus answering, saith unto him, have faith in God. Well, let, let's switch this for just a moment back to the, the, the previous subject, and then we'll deal with the mountain or the fig tree, or yeah, the mountain in this, this time, right? Uh, yeah. One time it's a tree, this time it's a mountain. Let's go back to this. Have faith in God. If God has come to you in an inconvenient time of life, it is for your benefit as much as anything that he is trying to get you involved with him and his kingdom at a time that's inconvenient for you because that may just possibly be your salvation. Because if he leaves you in that situation with no challenge, with no call, with no purpose, with no reason to go beyond where you are, you will wither up and die and you won't have to be cursed so when you when God comes to you and says I want you to be involved with this I want you to do this and you say to him you got to be kidding I thought you were God don't you know what's going on in my life you want me to get involved with this now this thing I'm going through is about to kill me as it is I don't have anything left for it. I don't have anything left. And you're wanting what from me? You're wanting what from me? You want me to do what? Hello? Have faith in God. Trust his mercy. Trust his goodness. Trust his love. Trust his motives. 
Trust him. Trust God. If he's, he knows what you're going through. And if he's come to you at an inconvenient time in your life, he may be just trying to save your soul. He kata halo to buku sata bahaya. He ti e kuta sana na mana haya. Ti e kula rata rata na haya. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus name. So Jesus answered them, have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say to this mountain, unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that you receive them, and ye shall have them. Now, let me, let, me, um, let me help to qualify this in your mind. This is not some blanket rule or offering or principle or whatever that you and I can take and just do whatever we want to with it. Remember what Jesus said. He said, the day will come. You will say, physician, heal thyself. And they said that and more. They said, he saved others. Himself he cannot save. Why? Because when the scripture says, you have not because you ask not. And you ask and have not because you ask amiss that you may consume it unto your own lusts. These scriptures are not blanket invitations for you to use God as your personal piggy bank. That's not what this is talking about. He is not your or my personal piggy bank. In Jesus' name, give me a, Mer a Rolls Royce. And if you can't do that, I'll take a Mercedes. Worst thing could ever happen is that happen for you. So, John, I'm coming back to this dear computer person. John chapter 15, verse 1. Let's find out what he's talking about. Are there qualifications? Yes, there's qualifications. John 15, verse 1. I, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. The word clean there means pruned. Literally in the Greek it means pruned. Abide in me, and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in me in, in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him. The same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. Boy, talk about qualifications right there. Does Mark 11 work? Absolutely, 100% it works. Is it true? It is literally true, exactly what it says. But if you're going to exercise that and be saved when it's all over with, you better meet these qualifications. Verse one more time. One more time. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him. The saint, no, verse one, please. I am the, vine, tr the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch in me that beareth fruit, he purgeth it. That's the same Greek word as translated clean in the next verse. That it may bring forth more fruit. He prunes the productive. He cuts the dead wood off the productive branch 
to make it more fruitful. Jesus, help us. Jesus, help us. If you came to this seminar looking for a magic formula, a magic, spiritually magic wand, you could wave and the devil would part waves like the Red Sea and you'd become some honcho. You are now very disappointed. We can't give you your money back. We didn't charge you anything for it. I need that on screen, please. Thank you. I, I don't want that to leave the screen. I want it indelibly imprinted in their brains, okay? <laughs> now, you're clean through the word which I've spoken unto you. If you're being pruned, that's a good sign. <laughs> if the Lord, if the word of God's cutting on you, <laughs> that's a good sign. <laughs> if you're saying, are, are you ever going to let up? Yeah, Saturday morning. No problem. I'm going to let up Saturday morning. I'm going to cut you some slack Saturday morning. Of course, I don't know what the Lord's going to do because you'll be someplace else probably. Oh, man. Ow. Ooh. What you, ah. Ah. Can't you say something that feels good? No. No. Because the word is pruning. If you're feeling cutting on you, you need to thank God for that. Because he doesn't bother, bother pruning the unfruitful and unfaithful. He just cuts them off the brine and throws them away. So if you're sitting here and the word is working on you, you need to thank God for that. Oh, ah, ooh, ah, ah, ooh, ah, ah, ah. You need to be thankful for that because that proves he's still got hope for you. He's got hope for you. I, I've never been involved with a vineyard, but I've read this statement. I'm assuming it's true. It was written for somebody it was. You can't grow next year's grapes on last year's wood. The stuff that was in your life that was used as a part of you being fruitful last year, that stuff's got to be cut off. It was only used for, for last year. He's got to cut that off because he's going to grow, grow some new stuff for this year's crop. My God. I said he's going to grow some new wood for this year's crop. And if the word's cutting on you, you need to give thanks to God for that if you're receiving it with the right attitude because that's God preparing you to be fruitful in the next go-round. Next verse. Abide in me. And I and you. Whew. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. Abide. It doesn't mean visit. Sinner men visit prostitutes, but you, you, you abide with a wife. You visit for pleasure, you abide for relationship. Hang on, are you ready? Some of us need to quit treating the church like a prostitute where we show up for a little pleasure, but we have no commitment. God. Ooh, that one hurts saying it. But it's true. You show up 
and the pleasure's not up to your standards. So the next time you see the madam, you're gonna find, try to find you a church that produces more pleasure. Because the last one, she didn't have the right tricks to produce pleasure in you. So you're a church hopper. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. You got a prostitute loving spirit on you. And it's an insult to a church for you to show up. Because you're implying they're willing to be your trick for the evening. Abide in me. Let's go back one verse. Abide in me. Abide in me. Not three times a week for a couple of hours a night. Abide in me. And if you abide in me, I'm going to abide in you. And whether it's a good day or a bad day, you won't have to go fumbling around in the spiritual dark trying to find Jesus in an emergency. I said if you're abiding in him and he's abiding in you in a crisis, you won't have to go be fumbling around in your spiritual dark trying to find Jesus. I ride down the road with my wife. She's sitting right there. But that's not enough. I want to I wanna be touching. I want to be touching. Because I'm not, I'm not just in the car saying, I don't just happen to be in the same car with her. I'm abiding with her in that car. I'm abiding with her in that house. We're, we're together. We're in a relationship. I'm not insulting her taking my wife and trying to make her into a prostitute and judging her by pleasure. How you doing? So you come to church, you give it the old thumbs up, thumbs down. Is this clear enough to get? I think so. And we wonder why stuff doesn't happen for us. And we're not abiding. Abide in me. And I in you. You know the easiest way to not sin? Don't do anything you can't pray while you're doing it. If you can't praise God while you're watching that movie, you probably shouldn't be watching that movie. If you can't praise God while you're on that website, you shouldn't be on that website. Because when you're abiding in him and he's abiding in you, your first and foremost priority is protecting his presence in your life. My God. Ah. Woo. You're protecting his presence. You're protecting his presence. It was a lot better being a pastor without Facebook around. Because I could at least live in some kind of ignorance that people were doing right. I tweeted or posted or whatever it was some time back. People used to journal. They didn't want anybody reading their journal. Now they just Facebook and tell the whole world. And they don't just tell you what all they're doing. They put pictures on there so there's no doubt what they're talking about. I'm not a policeman. I don't play policeman. But when you shove the evidence in my face, what am I supposed to do about it? Are you daring me? Are you daring the pastor to do something about it? 
I'm supposed to be singing. I'm supposed to be, I'm supposed to be teaching Sunday school. I'm supposed to be a care group leader. I'm supposed to be in the ministry. I'm supposed to be in leadership. And look at this. Really? And then you're going to be offended when we question you about it? Huh? Hey, you better scroll down through your list of friends. I'm on your list. And the pastor's on your list. And if you don't want us on there, just remove us. But apparently it doesn't matter to you because we're still there. There's no abiding. But oh, my friend, if you ever learned how awesome life is, just abide in him. I had an old prophet of God tell me as a young pastor, and I'm struggling, and I'm clawing, and I'm wrestling, and I'm trying, I'm trying to hear the voice of God. I'm going to hear the voice of God. And he just kind of looks at me, and she shakes his head. And then he says something to me that, to be honest with you, I didn't believe when he said it. He said, there will be a day, Brother Wright, there will be a day where you will fellowship with the Lord all the time. You will talk to him any time of the day or night. He'll talk back because you're never out of each other's presence. There will be a day. And I'm thinking, you got to be kidding when I can't even feel God half the time. And trying to get a word so I could preach. Feels like, you know, Jacob only wrestled with God once. Why do I have to wrestle every time it's time to preach? Take this any way you want to take it. Think anything you want to think about it. But his prophecy came true. I had somebody say to me today, I'm so upset. He said, the devil has made me believe that if I died out to myself, that I would just become an automaton with no life. But I'm beginning to see that's a lie. And I said, oh, yeah, it's a lie. And if you'll just cross on over. I said, I believed those exact words for years. I didn't say it because I was afraid to say it. But it's what I thought. It's the image that was put in my mind that I would lose my personality. I would lose myself. I wouldn't even exist anymore. I'd be some kind of spiritual zombie, some kind of automaton. You know, I would just kind of go through the motions and, 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 and I wouldn't even have a life. And, and the adversary put that in me and made dying out to myself so totally, totally unappetizing but when in God when God brought me up between a rock and a hard spot just like he was between Golgotha and Gethsemane where he was a rock and a hard spot he brought me up between my rock and a hard spot and I didn't have any choice but to rebel and be lost or die okay Lord this water's probably freezing but I've dipped my toe in it long enough I don't have any choice I'm either going to jump or you're pushing. And you jump in. And instead of it being ice cold and horrible, it's the most pleasant, refreshing feeling. And you go, I have been duped and participated with the deception because I believe the lie. I didn't cease to exist. I just moved from life through death to abundant life. Abide in me. Abide in me. You want to know how you can speak to the mountain? Abide in the mountain mover. And let the mountain mover abide in you. My God. You think I just said that nice cliche? That's a secret. You won't have absolute confidence that you can say to your mountain and doubt not in your heart that when you speak that mountain, it's going to move. Abide in the mountain mover and let the mountain mover abide in you. I'm saying it again. Only a, only a fraction of you even got it that time. <laughs> 
You want to have absolute confidence that whatever's resisting the kingdom of God and the ministry that God has given you for your place in the purpose and the plan of God, when you speak to that thing, it's going to yield, it's going to give. The way you guarantee that is you abide in the mountain mover and let the mountain mover abide in you. Oh, you want proof? Let's go to the next verse. Here we go. You ready? You ready? I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. As I said earlier today, that word much is the same Greek word is plenteous. The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. The harvest is guaranteed. The question is the laborers. Plenteous harvest, much fruit, same word, same dimension. Let's see. We need to baptize somebody here. Uh, well, somebody needs to fix the, somebody needs to fill the bap baptismal tank. Why? Because there's no water in it. Oh, wait, let's see. We can't, something's wrong with the faucets because they won't fill. Unfortunately, this is not hypothetical. This happened. Because nobody knows how long it had been since there had been water in the tank. And that was okay. It's okay. It's okay. Well, it was okay for them up to that point, I guess. Is that okay with you? That bad baptistry ought to be in use any time of the day or night. It is not unusual around here for us to hear about a couple days later, oh, a, few people, a couple of people were baptized the other night. How, didn't you baptize them? Are you kidding me? I'm the mortician. I don't dig graves and fill them in. That's somebody else's job. <laughs> I never said that before, but I like it. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's what an evangelist is, isn't he? He's a mortician, gets people ready for the, to be buried. Here it is. You ready? Here's the number one principle of being fruitful in the kingdom of God. For without me, ye can do what? Nothing. The Greek word for without means separate apart from, at any space from. And in this metaphor, a branch that went through weather and a strain was put on the connection between the branch and the vine and you, it, it was somehow split or under pressure, but when the, the weight of the snow or whatever it was came back off it, it looked like it, it came back up so that it looked like a healthy connection, but it wasn't until all the other branches began to pr produce fruit and this one didn't. And you know then there was a problem with the connection if you're not fruitful, the, the, the first and foremost place to look is the problem with the connection. It's the problem with the connection. Next verse. Get ready now. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Now remember, we're talking about moving mountains. Here it is. Next verse. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. The Bible is a whole document. It's the word of God. It's not the words of God. It's the word of God. 
And you can't take any one verse and interpret, interpret it without the others because then you, you're not interpreting, you're interpolating. And interpolating, you fill in the dots that you think they are where they're supposed to be with no actual factual basis for those dots. It's just there's a, there's a dot here and there's a dot here and there's space there and you assume it's a straight line so you fill in the dots. That's interpolation. You don't know for sure. And too many of us don't interpret scripture, we interpolate scripture because we fill in our opinion in between a few facts. Here it is. This is it, folks, right here. You want to know how to move your mountain? Abide in him. Let him, his words, abide in you. And you can ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. You know why? Because that right there guarantees you're not going to use that for your selfish purposes. Jesus' name. Back to Mark eleven twenty two. Have faith in God, Jesus said. Have faith in God. For verily, truly, I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart. How could you do that? Because you abide in him, he abides in you. You have absolute confidence. Because you're not doing this of yourself. You're hearing and repeating what he gives you to say. He's telling you what the will of God is in heaven, and then you're speaking it into existence on earth. The literal Greek for, I know that I give the keys to the kingdom of heaven, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The literal Greek is, whatever you bind on earth shall have already been bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth shall have already been loosed in heaven. We're not the initiator, we're the conduit. <laughs> He's the initiator. We're the conduit. And when, you, when you're connected, when you're the conduit and you're connected, you're connected to the source. You abide in him. He's abiding in you. You're abiding in him. His words abide in you. When he turns on the faucet and the flow starts and out starts coming words against your mountain, that mountain's going to be moved because it's not a human being talking to it. It's the almighty God that's abiding in you and your abiding in him is flowing through you, speaking to that mountain. And that mountain does not dare disobey God. There's no other way not to doubt in your heart. What things, oh, I love this. What things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Philippians 2.13, please. For it is God that worketh in you, or which worketh in you. It is God which worketh in you. The Greek word there for work means to activate, to cause to be operative. It is God that activates in you and causes to be operative, both to will, philema, wish, want, or desire, and to do, dunamai, the verb form of dunamis, supernatural impartation of the ability to do what you cannot do through your own ability, of that which pleases him. So get this, whatsoever things ye desire, if you've got grace working in your life, and that's what grace is. Grace is not, uh oh grace is unmerited favor. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, unmerited favor. Uh, that's really good. And Peter said, grace be multiplied unto you, so you can multiply unmerited favor? Huh. And Peter told us the last, his last recorded words. We're to grow in grace, so you, you, unmerited favor can grow? Huh? That makes a whole lot of sense, doesn't it? No, that's the definition that people put on that so they can find an excuse to live any way they want to live. 
and say it's the grace of God. The unmerited favor of God means I don't have to earn it. I can live any way I want to. He's going to love me anyway. Yeah, yeah. He loves the prisoners in prison. He loves the people in hell. He's God. He can't stop loving. <laughs> what things soever you desire, where's that desire come from? God activates the desire in you. That's why Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. I've said this a thousand times probably. <laughs> the blessing is not being filled. The blessing is the hunger and thirst. Because you can't be filled until you first hunger and thirst. And if you don't hunger and thirst, you won't be filled. So the blessing is you hunger and thirst, which then positions you to be filled. What things soever you desire. Well, where does this desire come from? The carnal don't get those desires. And the carnals can just spew off all they want. And then they can say, that doesn't work. No, it doesn't work for you. It doesn't work for you. Because you didn't get from the source what to say to the mountain. In fact, you haven't even heard from the source what the mountain is. Abide. Abide in me. And I'll, I'll abide you. But we settle for obstacles. Because we don't want to fight. Chamberlain, the Prime Minister of England, gave up much of Czechoslovakia and other areas around about. Finally, he so in convinced Hitler he wasn't going to do anything about it. He finally invaded Poland. And Chamberlain finally said, That's enough. Too late. It's too late. It's too late. When I was a kid, it was called detente. We were a superpower. The Russians were a superpower. Detente meant we just agreed to move our hands from the buttons. But the buttons are still there. They were still there then, they're still there now. Detente. And we settled for detente while bit people dug <laughs> concrete bunkers in their backyard to survive a nuclear explosion. Right. Because it was better to just appease than it was to fight. And there's a spirit of appeasement that's in the church of the living God today. There is a spirit of appeasement. Let's just, let's just don't disturb stuff. Let's just don't turn on any, let's, let's just don't expect peop, of people more than they're willing to give. Let's don't challenge them. Let, let, let's don't, let's don't call to them. Let's don't let the Lord speak to them. Let's just, let's just appease them. Hopefully they'll stick around and the money will keep flowing. And we, and, and we can feel better about ourselves because we'll call it love. It is. It is love. It's the love of money. And love of fame that a crowd brings you. Notice this. In verse 23, it was called speaking to the mountain. And that was equated in verse 24 to prayer. Hmm. I wonder how many of us pray if those two are equal. Luke 17 verse 5. And the apostles said unto him, increase our faith. 
And the Lord said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, which 99% of you know is the smallest of seed of all herbs or all plants or whatever. If you had, if you had uh, faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto this sycamine tree, and be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. But Jesus gives us another clue as to why we can't move our mountains. Verse 7. But, that's the conjunction. He just connected what he's about to say with what he just said. You want more faith, you don't need more faith. Even mustard seed sized faith can say to this tree, be plucked up by the roots and be, be cast into the sea. And it'll obey you. I mean, you can just see that tree flying through there. Woo. How'd that happen? I don't know. Somebody's talking today, I guess. Somebody spoke to that tree. But which of you, having a servant, plowing or feeding cattle, the words feeding cattle come from the verb that's the root word of pastor or shepherd. Feeding cattle, and actually this is feeding sheep, literally in the Greek. Jesus said to Peter, lovest thou me? Feed my sheep, same word. Feed my sheep. Plowing, what is plowing? Plowing. The World Network of Prayer has an amazing ministry. It's an awesome ministry. It's called Plowing Before the Planting. And, and, and as the Lord leads and provides the ability to do this, they go where home missionaries are trying, either about to start or have started. And they bring in a team of intercessors. And they intercede in that city. And they call that plowing to get the seed ready. And that's why we have so little harvest because we see so seed on fallow ground that hasn't been plowed up because the intercessory prayer breaks up the fallow ground that gets the ground ready for the seed. So which of you that's been out there plowing ground to get it ready for the seed of the word of God or you are feeding God's sheep as a shepherd, will say unto him by and by, that servant that's doing those things, when he has come from the field, go and sit down to meet. No, 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 no. And will not rather say unto him, make ready wherewith I may sup and gird thyself and serve me. You've been in the field plowing. You've been out there taking care of my sheep. And you've come in, you worked all day, and, 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 and he doesn't say to you, hey, you're tired, go take a break. He says, gird yourself. Get yourself cleaned up, get dressed. Come here and feed me first. Make thyself, make, make ready wherewith I am I sup, and gird thyself and serve me. Till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. That's old English for I don't think so. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which is our duty to do. Some of you need a revelation tonight that you, you can't do enough to earn it. Because everything you're doing, he commanded you. The only credit you get is that you obeyed him. Didn't earn anything, no profit in it. You didn't profit him at all. You profited yourself. And if you're doing things he didn't command... Now you're trying to earn your righteousness by your works, and Cain, he's going to reject you every time. Because if your offerings to God don't have blood in it, he's not accepting them. I don't care how hard you work, how much effort you put into it, how much you were trying to win God's approval, 
He's rejecting Cain's offering every time, every time, every time. Oh, Jesus, help us. <laughs> oh, God. There's some of you people, you're so precious, but you are trying so hard to win God's approval. And it's not working for you. And I got a revelation for you. It will never work. It will never work. You cannot earn his love or approval. It's not going to work. God accepted Abel's sacrifice. How did Abel know to bring a sacrifice of blood? I can't find anywhere in the scripture where, where, where it was communicated to Abel, to Cain and Abel, give me a sacrifice of, of blood. But Cain decided, I don't, I don't, I don't raise sheep. I can't raise, uh, bring you blood. I, 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 I'm a tiller of the soil. I can only bring you the, 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 the produce that I have produced by my labor. My labor. Here's my offering, God, because of my labor. All of my efforts to make this happen. I mean, Lord, look, look, at, look, at, my, look at my voucher here. Look at all the hours I've prayed. Look at all the days I've fasted. Look at all the, the, t the time I've spent studying. What, 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 what are you, you going to give me for that? Well, exactly what it's profited God. Nothing. I'll tell you what's going to get you. Rejected. He's going to reject your offering. And then if you get mad because he rejected your offering, then you're the one going to get rejected. See, that's your choice. You bring that offering of your self-effort to win God's love and approval, and God rejects it. If you, if you have the grace to accept the rejection, then there's still a chance that you will be accepted. Because he says to Cain, Abel, uh, to Cain and, I'm, and I'm paraphrasing now, you know what's expected. If you'll go bring that offering, you'll be accepted. He gave Cain a second chance. But Cain was so offended that God didn't accept his efforts as an offering and let him earn a little approval and earn righteousness by his efforts. That he got so angry with God that he couldn't kill God, so he just killed his brother. He just killed his brother. And I'll tell you what, in every church, those that are trying to obligate God by what they do for him, always end up trying to kill those that realize their righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And the only thing they can give God is them. And there's nothing else they can give God but them. They have nothing else they can give God but them. Because everything good that is, comes out of them is God. In me, that is in my flesh, there dwelleth no good thing. Not there used to dwell, there dwells no good thing. And so therefore, if there's any good that comes out of me or through me, it ain't me and I can't take the credit for it. And if I'm connected to the vine over here and there's fruit hanging off the end of me over here, I can't boast in that fruit. My God. All I did was abide. All of this out here isn't something I produced or that I can take the credit for. All that proves I was, is I've got a healthy connection with the vine. How did Abel know? How did Abel know? Why did Cain know? Well, because the first blood sacrifice is in the Bible, but it's not specified as that. Adam and Eve sinned. They were naked, but they didn't know they were naked because they were clothed with innocence. They sinned. They lost their innocence, so they began to realize they were naked. So God 
either had to kill them because that was his word. The day you, you eat of this, you shall surely die. Somebody had to die or God would have been a liar. So somebody had to die. So in, in order to keep from killing Adam and Eve, he slew animals, just any animals. Well, I believe the garden wasn't an immense space. And because of that, the animals that dwelt in the garden, Adam and Eve named them. It's in the book. He didn't say, I think I'll call this a giraffe, and this is an elephant, and this is a rhinoceros. No. You got a dog? Yeah. Is that dog's name Dog? What's his name, her name? Winston. That's a highfalutin name for a dog. <laughs> he doesn't say dog. He says Winston. No, Winston says Scott. <laughs> you need to do something for me right now. Is that true or what? Yeah, you don't have animals, they have you. So you think Adam and Eve spent some indeterminate period of time in the garden. But it wasn't a short period. And they didn't know these, all these animals? Yes, they did. And so when God chose to sub, find substitutes to die rather than Adam and Eve, they knew those animals. God made coats of skins to clothe Adam and Eve's nakedness. To get skins that come from animals, the animal can't die if you take the skin off. I can't live if you take the skin off of him. And in the process of taking the skin off, if you haven't already killed the animal, the, the animal's gonna die. And you don't die without blood. And those animals gave their life. Adam and Eve knew those animals, and those innocent animals gave their life as a substitute for Adam and Eve to cover their nakedness with coats of skin. And Cain and Abel knew all about that, even though they were born out of the garden. No, they weren't born out of the garden. Seth was the first one born out of the garden. So guess what? I, hey, I hadn't even thought of that like this before. They had to be there and watch that. So Jesus is saying, you want me to increase your faith? I'll tell you how to increase your faith. You want to speak, you want to, speak to this sycamine tree and have it obey you? Obey me. You want that fig tree to listen to you? Listen to me. You submit to me, even when it doesn't make sense to you. I'm tired. I've been out here doing your work all day. And I come home and I'm hungry. And you want me to what? What you been up in here doing all day? While well, I've been out there plowing your fields and taking care of your sheep. What are you doing in here? And I've been out here all day doing this stuff, I, I, and, 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 and I can't even come serve you till I clean up. That's what he meant, gird yourself. Uh, you can't feed yourself first, but you're going to clean up first. And then you're going to come and feed me till I am filled with food and drink. And then you can go take care of your needs. Boy, is that unfair. Ugh. What a cruel taskmaster our God is. No, no. Hear me, some of you need to hear this. God always asks of you what appears to be unreasonable as an opportunity for you and him 
to check your submission to him. He's not just checking your submission. He's giving you an opportunity to check your submission. Because what kind of attitude do you know you have? Now, he's God. He knows what kind of attitude you've got. But he's asking you, do you know what kind of attitude you got? We're talking about moving mountains, folks. Excuse me if I'm too transparent with you. Excuse me. But there's been a few times I had to pray till I had a right attitude. Even if I submitted first. I don't remember exactly how the story goes. But the parent was trying to get the little boy to go to bed. It's this way I'm telling it. If you know it a different way, I got the mic. <laughs> he didn't want to go to bed. His mom was trying to get him to go to bed. He wouldn't do it. Finally, she said, you get in that bed right now. He said, I'll lay down, but I'm standing up inside. And I got to admit there sometimes I did what he said, but inside I was still standing up. And I had to pray for a little while and get an attitude adjustment so my submission wasn't just in action, but was in spirit. And he put me through that situation so I had a good indicator where I was right then. Why? Because I'm going to tell you what, if trees are going to go through flying through the air, you sure better have your feet on good, solid spiritual foundation or you're going to get a big head. Because here's the deal. When mountains start moving and trees start flying, I'll tell you what happens. If you're not totally submitted to God so that you know the source of all of that is him, the next thing you know somewhere deep in your heart, you're going to begin to say, look what I did. That's pretty cool, isn't it? See what I did? You see what I did with that there? You see that? Hey, hey, that's pretty good. And initially, you'll only say it to your closest friends. That's pretty good what I did, wasn't it? And after a while, the whole world will know that you think, I did pretty good with that, didn't I? Everybody stand up and give me applause. I did pretty good with that, didn't I? That's the end product of this, see? That's the end product of it. It's the end product of it. You want your mountain to move? <laughs> it's not just abiding in him and he abiding in you. It's not just being connected to the vine. It's having a right attitude when the vine expects stuff of you that's not right. When, when the husband decides to cut on you a little bit as a branch, cut some things off you you were kind of trying to hold on to. Because it was pretty good stuff you had last year. But, but God says, nah, it was last year. i got to take that off you before you get too attached to that and begin to think you're something with that. Yes. Oh, I'll give you fruit next year. But all that stuff I used to create fruit last year, i got to cut some of that away unless you begin to take ownership of that and begin to believe that's you. I'm talking about how to move your mountains. Because otherwise, you're going to pray against that mountain and nothing's going to happen. And you're going to condemn God. You're going to call him a liar. I did what you said. It didn't work. If I remember correctly, and I may be wrong, but if I remember correctly, when it says don't doubt in your heart, that word doubt means to be double-minded, two-spirited. And it also implies that you... You, 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 have a, you have an interest, a controlling interest in, in something. And so you want it to go a certain way. And so you're trying to make it go that way. And you're, you're afraid it's not going to go that way. So instead of just letting the Lord do it through you and give you the words to say, and you speak it in his authority because you're submitted to him, and it's his authority that's actually speaking it, you, you, you're trying to mix you in there just a little bit to just make sure it goes like you want it to go, how you want it to go rather than just committing it to him. Well, that was great prayer when we started tonight, wasn't it? Wow. 
wow, that was really, I don't know if I've ever experienced anything just like that before. But that spirit just kept flowing in. And it just kept switching languages. I don't know if I've ever experienced that quite like that before. I have no idea what it means. It, it seemed like I, I prayed in about seven, eight, nine languages. Now, get this. That happened. But here's, here's what I'm talking about. I prayed about seven or eight languages tonight. How about you? How many languages did you pray in? Or, wow. That was awesome what God did. Did you hear those languages? I didn't have anything to do with that. I just let it flow and listen to what he's saying. And it just kept switching languages. God, you're awesome. You see the difference here? That one, I'm trying to take some credit for it. And then trying to compare myself with you to say, you're not you're as good as me. And this attitude, you're going, God, you are awesome. Because first of all, there's the acknowledgement. Anybody's got the Holy Ghost, he can do that through him if they let him and he chooses to do it. So how can I brag over that, right? If you want things in this world to be under your authority... You got to be an authority. If you want the stuff below you, if you want the people below you, wife, kids, church, mountains. Now I'm not equating wife with mountains, but you know, I just just run a list here. <laughs> Hi, Alice. I love you. God bless you. I appreciate you so. Much. No, I'm your mouth and I'm in your way for half the time. But anyway, if, if you want that which is supposed to be in submission to you to be under submission to you, you've got to be in submission because all authority is delegated. And if you're not in submission, you cut off your source of supply of authority. And now you're usurping authority. Any authority you're trying to exercise to those under you that did not come from your submission to authority over you, it's false authority. It's usurped authority. And it brings a curse on you and everybody that listens to you. Real quickly here. Matthew 17, verses 19 through 21. Sometimes we must refocus and resubmit ourselves for our faith to work. The promises of God always work. If they are not working, there is always a reason. And it's never God. Matthew 17, 19. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And they're referring to a situation where a guy brought his son who was demon-possessed, and they couldn't cast out the demon. And Jesus cast the, 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 the demons out of the, the boy. And so they came to Jesus when they got out of the public eye because they didn't want anybody to hear this conversation where they admitted they failed. Why couldn't we cast him out? Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. You mean, you mean the guys that are going to be the foundation of the church? <laughs> Had unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Now, Permit me to tell you what I believe that means. What kind? Demons are demons for the most part. 
He said, in my name, you'll cast out devils. He didn't say, in my name, you'll cast out some kinds of devils. What kind is he talking about there? He's talking about when you're praying against devils and there's something in your life that's just not in alignment with him. Disconnection, you're not abiding, he's not able to abide in you, you're not submitted. Whatever the reason is that it's not working, that, that's not going to go, that, that situation that's not responding to you is not coming out till after you spend some time in prayer and fasting and getting whatever's messed up in you and wrong in you fixed. Prayer and fasting. <laughs> Devils don't respond to you because you've been fasting. That proves you don't have a clue what fasting's about. Fasting is only intended to, per to change me. It doesn't, per it doesn't change God's mind. We don't fast to change God's mind. We fast and pray to be changed so that we are now more in alignment with God so that when we do what he promised, it would happen like he promised. Now, Lord, I have fasted three days and I'm expecting you to give me some miracles tonight. You're getting one right now. You're breathing. That's a miracle. That's a miracle of the grace of God. That he didn't smite your stinking attitude dead on the spot. You're going to get some miracles because you fasted. You, didn't fa you should have fasted 50 days. Then you might have had a miracle. You could have been raised from the dead. Because apparently your fasting hadn't done you one bit of good, but puff you up a little bit. God, look how I'm suffering. Don't you feel sorry enough for me to use me mightily? Because look at me suffer. <laughs> one of my mentors when I was a young preacher, for better or for worse, was Brother Billy Colton. Now, in this particular thing, thank God he wasn't my only mentor. Because he said to me more than once, he said, Brother Wright, all kind of guys out there fasting and praying. Not me. I'm feasting and believing. <laughs> now, there's one thing I couldn't find fault with. Whatever he was doing was working. And what I was doing wasn't. And of course, the thing I knew about that he didn't go into at that point is he had spent much, much time in fasting and prayer in his life. But he was trying to make a point. He was trying to make a point that there were a lot of guys that he was trying to mentor and help who thought they were getting something from God because of all the fasting and praying. God, I'm fasting 10 days a week. I'm praying 30 hours a day. Aren't you impressed? You ought to make me Apostle Paul Jr. Look at all I'm doing for you, God. That fella doesn't need to be speaking any mountains because that one's going to fall on him. Because in that case, that mountain isn't the devil, it's God. Because if you don't fall on the rock and get broken, the rock's going to fall on you and grind you to powder. I'm not up here entertaining you. That's not the purpose of this. Jesus cannot lie. And if you're willing to cloak your unbelief in some kind of positive rags by saying, well, I tried that and it didn't work. And without saying it, you're implying the Lord either didn't tell the truth or he's failed because that didn't work. 
Because the first place you should look when something doesn't work that God said will work is in the mirror, the spiritual mirror of the Word of God. Okay, Jesus, I've obviously got something that's preventing you from doing what you said you'd do because you can't lie, and this works. Do you know what your mountain is yet? I asked you last night to be praying, asking the Lord to help you to determine your mountain. You know what it is yet? Well, what do I say to my mountain? Well, let me see. Let me, I'll give you a formula to repent, to repeat. Not. You ever heard of the Holy Ghost? You ever heard of the one abiding in you? Because he's going to give me one thing to say to my mountain. He'll give you a different way to speak to your mountain. Because your mountain and my mountain aren't the same mountain necessarily. So there's no magic formula that you can repeat in your flesh. It has to be the Spirit. It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. The rhema, the words, Greek is rhema. The rhema that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. Nothing. Even your good flesh that's never been a bad person. I don't believe you should baptize, backslide so you can come back to God and have a testimony. But some of us would be better off backslidden a while where we can't deny we're backslidden than those of us that are living backslidden in heart trying to force God to accept us as righteous through our own works. And we can't see it. We're blind to it. We can't acknowledge it. We can't do it. So we stay in this mire and it's quicksand, and we're going down, and it's sucking us in, and we're still holding our ground. What ground? You're in quicksand, but we're holding our ground. I'm not doing anything wrong. There's nothing wrong with me. It's wrong with this, this one, this one, and God that put me in this spot. He said, you could say unto this mountain, be thou removed. Be thou cast in the sea. And if you doubt not in your heart, that means there's no self left in what you're doing. It's going to happen just like what you said. Now, <laughs> I just work here. Okay, I'm not the boss. Who, what idiot in his right mind plans to do 10 sessions in three and a half days, back to back to back, at 68 years old? A lunatic? You, you, you got to be a lunatic. What are you trying to do? There's easier ways to commit suicide. Lunacy. From a human standpoint. But to stand up here with the idea that you're going to go say, that was some really good stuff. Why? That was, wasn't that entertaining? Oh, that's really good. Blah, 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 blah. Puke. Let me throw up now. I'd rather you leave here mad at me. I'm serious. Three responses to the word. Glad, mad, and indifferent. The first two are good. The third one isn't. Folks, I've got a promise from God that somebody's going to get this. And he did not, I don't mean one person. But the Lord's promised me that there's going to be people who are going to get this and they're going to go home different. 
and their lives are going to be different from this point. Not because of me. They're going to go home different. And they're going to live differently. And they're going to minister differently. But most importantly, they're going to pray differently than they've ever prayed in their life. I've got a promise from God. And there's no other reason to be standing here doing this to me and you. But a promise. My God. Somebody somebody's going to get a revelation that prevailing persistent prayer that gets a hold of God and joins with him and fights every obstacle and prays promises into existence and breaks through barriers and produces fruitful harvest fields and powerful, powerful flows of the Holy Ghost in services. Somebody's going to get a revelation that that time spent with God is a privilege and something to be desired, not avoided. Somebody's going to decide that it's a small price to pay till you eventually pray it enough, it stops being a price at all. It's a privilege. It's an opportunity. And God has invited me to participate. And I'm going to see stuff happen because I'm a part of him. He's a part of me. And I'm going to do it because he said it. Somebody's going to get that. Somebody's going to get it. Somebody's going to get that. Somebody's going to get that. Somebody's going to go home and see your area different. Somebody's going to go home and not see how hard it is, how difficult it is, but how great God is and how faithful he is. And it's going to buckle down and pray. And if it takes a week, they're going to pray. If it takes a month, they're going to pray. If it takes a year, they're going to pray. If it takes two years, three years, whatever it is, they're going to make up their mind. If this works, God can't lie. And you're going to pray until it happens. Somebody in this crowd's going to do that. Somebody online is going to do that, whichever camera's pointed at me right now. Somebody listening to this message in the future is going to get it. They're going to get it. They're going to quit playing church and quit going through the motions and quit accepting the mundane and the bound and decide they want to see the living God be alive right now to the fullest he is willing to be at this moment. Somebody's going to get that. Somebody's going to get tired of looking up at mountains and have the revelation, I don't have to not be able to see the horizon anymore because the God that abides in me and that I abide in is able and willing to speak through me to move that mountain. Not for my convenience, but for the fruitfulness of the ministry of his kingdom. Somebody's going to get that. God has promised me. God's promised me. Somebody's going to get that. Somebody's going to quit making excuses for themselves and their church. Somebody's going to get honest. Somebody's going to humble themselves. Somebody's going to get a hold of God and let God get a hold of them till something begins to happen unlike anything they've ever experienced before. I got a promise. I got a promise. There's going to be some people go home different. I got a promise. I got a promise. And he didn't put any limit on how many would be able to receive that promise. He
Hilo rubu kuta hasa. Ikata hasa hata hata ba. Hilo burubu kusi kie tata. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. You lying spirit of religious tradition. You lying spirit of self righteousness. You lying spirit of accusing God. I bind and rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You lose every heart, every mind, every spirit is in this room. I lose the spirit of light, the God of light, to shine light in our lives, to bring truth to our minds, truth to our spirits, truth to our hearts. I lose the spirit of grace to empower us to respond. Somebody's going to get it. And the rest are going to find themselves on the outside looking in. Some of us are going to be on the field. The rest of us are going to be on the stands wishing we would have responded so we could be on the field. Somebody's going to get it. Somebody's going to be different. The seed of that's already working in some hearts and spirits right now. The seed of faith is already working in some hearts and spirits right now. In the name of Jesus. 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 Come on. Come on. Don't look around you and worry about something else. Get it. Get it for you, then get it for the kingdom. Come on, don't be left out. Don't be left out. The Lord is no respecter of persons. The Lord is no respecter of persons. Come on, come on, come on. My God, (laughs) my God, my God, my God. You lying spirit of blindness that's on these minds and hearts and spirits, I bind you in the name of Jesus. Loose them right now. I loose truth. I loose truth in these hearts and minds and spirits. Be free in Jesus' name. Be free in Jesus' name. He katahala ratatakahaya. Ikiye ki ala rata haya Tie kaha la rata ha Shekia kata ha sa ananananana maha Ikiye yata ha sa Ikiye ta ha sa ta ha la rata bahaya Jesus name in the name of Jesus 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 
in the name of Jesus. You're going to find him the moment you connect with him with your whole heart. If you're trying to connect to him and hold any part of you back, it's not going to work. But he promised the day, and I'm going to say the moment that you seek him with your whole heart, you'll find him that moment. Your whole heart. Your whole heart. Your whole heart. Jesus' name, Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. No, no, no. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hitaha, alara rarya rara batahaya. You'll know you got there when you stop praying for you and you begin to let the flow of the words of God speak through you towards your mountain. Come on, come on. You'll know you're getting there when you begin to speak to the mountain. When you speak to the mountain and there's a flow, when you speak to the mountain and there are words to say to the mountain, you'll know you're getting there. If you try to speak to the mountain and you don't have a clue what, the, what could come out of your mouth and you don't know what to say, then you need to keep praying for you. But when you get to, when you get to where you need to be, go, be going, there'll be words that'll start coming out of you speaking to your mountain. Come on, don't keep praying for you when those words for the mountain start coming. Speak to the mountain. Speak to the mountain. Speak to the mountain. Come on. Come on, speak to the mountain. Come on, speak to the mountain. Let the Holy Ghost give you words to say. And it's not enough to speak to the mountain in tongues. You gotta speak to the mountain in your native language, not just in tongues. Come on, when you connect to him, he'll begin to give you words to say in your language in, in, to the mountain. And then you can do like Paul, pray with the spirit, pray with the understanding also. And you'll sw switch back and forth between tongues speaking to the mountain and your language speaking to the mountain. Come on. I'd be happy for you in a sense if your mountain moved tonight, but it'd be better for you if it didn't. You need to start speaking to the mountain. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. I don't want to make this some doctrine. This is my personal feelings. But I can't speak, I can't exercise authority laying prostrate. That's not what that position says. I can't exercise authority sitting. When it's time for me to speak to the mountain, I'm going to stand up. I'm going to stand up and speak to that mountain. I'm going to exercise my authority standing up.
standing up is a position of strength. You stand up against the devil. You prostrate yourself on the floor in the face of God. Prostration is a position of humility, and you do that before God. But you stand up against the devil. You stand up when you war against him. The word worship means to prostrate. So if you're going to... If you're going to worship God, then you prostrate yourself on the ground. You need to spend some time doing that. It's positive for you. You don't have to do it just physically. You can do it in your heart. But that's what it means. You prostrate yourself before God physically and or in your spirit. But when it comes time to war, you stand. You stand against the devil. And then while you're standing, you speak against him. It's okay to pray against him in tongues as long as it's mixed with periods of speaking against him in your language as you let the Spirit give you words to say to your mountain. Don't judge what God's doing by what you're feeling or quote unquote seeing. He can't lie. He can't fail. Keep speaking it today and speak it tomorrow and speak it the next day and you speak it until it happens because God can't lie. God can't lie. God can't lie. God can't lie. Iki ala rata tata haya, ti eka ala rata tata kaha. Come on, come on. I know this is different than any call to war we've done, but this is the will of God for this meeting. This is the will of God for this meeting. This is something personal that you can take home and do. And God will give you results. Whether you're a preacher or a saint, you can take this home. In the name of Jesus. 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 He cut the yala rata tati hala rakata tahaya. Tie. Tie kahala rahata hala rata taha. Iki e kala rata haya. Iki e kala rahata tahata haya. Iki e kala rata haya. Siki e tama mama makahaya. Iki e kala rata tababaha. Ikiela Mahaya, Ikiela Ratatahaya. Ha! 
Kalarata tihe la rakata haya. Tihe kalarata haya. Tihe kaha ananana namahata ha. Ha. Sekihe kalarata haya. Tihe ka alarata haya. In the name of Jesus. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ma, 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 ana, ma, ma, ha. Tie kalororo boko ratata tahai. Ha. Sakati hela ratata hai. Ma, 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 ha. Ma, ma, ha, ta, ha. Tie kala ra ta 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 haya. I kala ro 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 bo ko ra ta 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 haya. I curse you, mouth and blindness and doubt, fear and unbelief. I command you to loose it. I command you to loose it, Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I kata kala ro 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 bo ko ra ta 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 haya. Tie kahai, tie kala rata hai, tie kala rata loroto bokora tata tabahai. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Tie kola rata loroto bokora tata tabahai. I kie kala rata ala rata ha ha, i kie ala rata ha ta ha ha ta ha ta ha. Tie kolo rota hara rata boko la rata tababa boko sahaya. Hallelujah. 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 Tie. Tie la 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 ta haya. Tie la ro 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 boko rata ta haya. Hallelujah. 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 Malororo bokora ta 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 ba 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 kata hai. Tie, tie kala ra ta ta ra ta hai. Simani ata hai. Tie kala ra ta loro to bota ta. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. He ki he kola ra ta ta ri ala ra ta ra ta ta hai. He ki he kala ra ta ta ra ra ta ta hai. Koloro ro toloro ta bokusha sai. Oh Jesus, Jesus, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. He kala ro toloro ta bokura ta 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 hai. Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Tie la ba 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 kata hai, ma 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 kasa ta hai. Now, you do not ever engage in warfare, personal or collective, against your mountain or against principalities and powers or whatever, without spending some time just honoring and loving God in English, or if it's your language. And in tongues. Come on. We're, we're not praying anymore now. We're just praising. We're just loving him. Come on. Let's just do that. Come on. We're just praising him. We're just loving him. We're honoring him. We're acknowledging him. We're giving all, him all the praise. We give him all the honor. Come on. Come on. Not asking any, anything. We're acknowledging him. 
we're giving him the credit. We're giving him, giving him the glory. Praise you, Father. Praise you, Father. Praise you, Father. Praise you, Father. Now, I'm not cutting, cutting you off because that was enough because you're going to need to do that more tonight while you, when you lay on the bed, before you fall asleep, whatever. You just need to do that. Here's another thing it's very necessary. Some of you know this, but it, you need to be reminded and then some need to hear it for the first time. There's four primary types of tongues, ministry in tongues. Uh, there's travail intercession. There's warfare intercession. Uh, then there's regular prayer and praise that we're so familiar with. But there's one we're not familiar with, and it's very, 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 very critical to you personally and your ability to continue to participate in God. I call it the rest and refreshing tongues. Isaiah 28, 11, and 12 says, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people to whom he said, This is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. People don't listen to this. Those other three ministries of tongues is all, the focus of it is what God is causing to flow out of you to him in prayer and praise and into the supernatural dimension in warfare or, and or travail intercession. But this other type tongue is not focused on what flows out of you. It's what flows into you. It is rest and refreshing. And if you don't pray this regularly, and quite honestly, this is the tongue I pray more than, any, than all the others put, put together. It's how I live. It's how I, I mean live. That's how I stay alive. It's how I have enough energy to function. It's how, after all of this, I'm going to be able to get up in the morning at 9.30 in the morning. We're going to do it again. Not because I'm strong, because I'm obviously not, and I'm not in great shape. It's not, it has nothing to do with physical strength. It has everything to do with supernatural strength. And, and rest and refreshing tongue, it's, it's, for the most part, not emotional. It's not, it's not loud and demonstrative. It's just a very, it's, it's a drinking in it's a replenishment of all that's been that you've allowed to flow out of you and 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 whatever it's a renewing of the virtue it's putting it all back in so that you have this mental emotional physical and spiritual strength to keep going and if you're especially if you're a person that's involved in intercessory warfare if you whether it's travail or warfare intercession if you don't learn to do this you will burn out Brother Billy Cole's wife, according to him, was the greatest intercessor he knew. The problem was she didn't want to do anything but intercede. And Brother Cole said, I didn't understand it, so I let her do it. Until she was so broken down inside, I took her to the doctor. And the doctor said, my God, man, what have you people been doing? I've never seen a woman, a person more totally, completely, physically exhausted than your wife. They had to come home from the field. They had to leave Thailand because of that. He said, Brother Wright, if I had understood what was going on, I would have seen to it that she spent time praying and praising God and letting the Lord replenish what she was put, take, putting out. But he said she got to where she felt guilty even if she laughed because people were going to hell. And she needed to be interceding for them. And, and, and it was so powerful. He said, I, I, I didn't feel right stopping it, but I let her destroy her health. And I was her covering. And I should have found the balance for that. Well, the Lord showed me this. It's rest and refreshing tongues. And I realized when he showed it to me, I'd been doing it for years. And that's how I went from being burnt out most of the time to really having rest and strength and peace. 
And you can pray this under your breath. I pray this on airplanes. I pray this walking through the mall. I pray this in the shower. I pray this on my bed. I pray this at the table. There isn't any place that I, I don't pray this. And I'm talking about the principle of the thing. I don't mean there's not certain words. I don't have a mantra. I just repeat mindlessly. But I just let the Spirit give me rest and refreshing. Not, Jesus' name. Now let's all play, pray rest and refreshing tongues in your own language. This is one of the tools that the Lord just said you're being given. I'm not giving it. He's giving it. Come on. Eyes closed, open, doesn't really matter. He got da 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 you're not giving out, you're taking in. It's like taking a deep breath. The manifestation of the Spirit that I feel most of the time when I'm praying like that is just the most gentle, just, just the most gentle manifestation of his spirit is so gentle and so tender and it's just he's not cramming stuff into me it's just a it's just a gentle refreshment a re gentle renewing it's a gentle rest that gives strength just gives strength back gives strength back the Spirit said tools. As long as your trust is not in the tools but in Jesus, it's good to have tools. They make jobs easier. That's what the Lord said. He's giving us tools. You need to use those tools. So, if, you're welcome, if you want to stay, you're welcome to stay. But I'm fixing to lay the mic down. I'm asking you to do two things. I'm asking you to spend some time this evening and tomorrow morning, four weeks from our next session, in just prayer and praise, real prayer and praise, in English or your native language and tongues. And then also spend some time in rest or refreshing tongues. And the Lord, when you do both of those, the Lord will begin to let you see and feel the difference. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will be continually in my mouth. Prayer and praise tongues. The blessing is God. You're blessing God. You're not seeking for a blessing. You're giving a blessing. You're letting the Spirit pray through you and bless God. But in rest refreshing tongues, you're receiving the blessing of rest, refreshing, renewal. So that you're ready to go again. In this end time, when this harvest breaks, and it will break, this is the only way we're going to be able to survive and do all he wants us to do. It's because we have learned to receive supernatural rest. In Jesus' name. Father, I thank you. And by your grace, 
I believe that I've said what you've given me to say, not adding or to or taking away from it. And I commit this word into your hands. And I commit that this word into the hearts and lives and the spirit of those that have heard it or will hear it. In Jesus' name, I command a hedge of angels to, to, to hedge around and protect each one of us to protect the seed until it grows and becomes fruitful to the glory of your kingdom. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.